back this to that. This conference will now be recorded. You can circle back to that as as necessary. Um, so be be mindful there and go there if you need to. There's some state tax filing guidance. Alabama Governor Ivy Governor Ivy uh, and the Alabama Department of Revenue was very quick to respond to the extended deadline. But this link, if you actually operate in multi states, actually Belda does. Um, if you operate in multi states, this link is was updated last night, um, April the 6th at 5 p.m. Gives you guidance on what other states are doing. It, not all states have made the, the decision to extend as of last night. They had not, but we all expect people in my world all expect that every single state will will allow filings uh, uh, to to July the 15th. We'll basically move April 15th to July 15th. So so be mindful there. All right. So some tax related provisions in the CARES Act. Most people when they talked about the CARES Act have talked about one issue, and it's the Paycheck Protection Program loan, and that's a huge, huge piece of the CARES Act. But there are other tax-related provisions that might be important to you and your small business. Um, this is something I mentioned before: loan forgiveness for the PPP. Up until the CARES Act, all loan forgiveness, with the exception of very specific and tight uh, ex exceptions for you know personal home-related things, um, debt forgiveness was taxable. It was taxable income to you if that ever happened. And you might have, if you experienced that in your life, you might have gotten some 1099 C's on, on, on that. So uh, this act, the CARES Act, ex, you know, expressly states that the forgiveness of the loans under the PPP program are not taxable. And so you've heard the phrase used in the, in the community and on social media of free money. Uh, well, there's no such thing as that, but you know, this is money that you're going to, if you do obtain forgiveness for your loan by meeting the requirements, that is money that you do not have to pay tax on. It's that loan forgiveness is not taxable. And so that's a nice feature that our government's put out there to help our small businesses get beyond uh, this COVID-19 crisis. And so there's some recovery rebates and other individual provisions I want to touch on briefly. Uh, and Will, if I run out of time, just interrupt and stop and we'll, we'll move forward. But uh, you've all heard about this recovery rebate for individuals. Uh, probably the second most talked about item in, in the CARES Act is that um, it, we, we get an advance of a, a credit that's going to be um, payable to taxpayers in 2020. It's $1,200 um, per person and $500 for a qualifying child. This is an advance payment of a recovery rebate uh, that's supposed to be paid via check or direct deposit within the next two weeks. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody receiving those yet, um, but we've been told uh, over and over that that's coming uh, this week and next. So be on the lookout for that. If you had a direct deposit of refunds or direct debit of your tax payments in your tax return for 2018 or 2019, these monies will be direct deposited into your bank account. If you've changed bank accounts, no worries. It'll get bounced back and they're supposed to send you a check. Um, and if you don't have a direct deposit, they'll be sending you a check as well to the home to the address of record. Um, there are opportunities on the IRS website to go and change your address if you if you don't have direct deposit or direct debit in your tax return and you have moved and some people might have moved multiple times. Uh, that's going to be problematic for you, but there are ways to get that corrected. So that's something that's out there for individual taxpayers. It's available to any individual who has a Social Security number and who is not a non-resident alien, claimed as a dependent on anybody else's return. Of course, the states and trusts don't qualify. It also includes individuals who collected Social Security benefits. So if you're uh, a, an individual who, who whose main source of income is Social Security and maybe you don't have to file a tax return, um, then you still get this money. They they know the, the government knows who you are and that you did not file a tax return and you still will qualify for that money. So you don't have to rush out and try to file a tax return with zero on it to to claim that credit. Um, it's going to phase out for folks. Um, if your AGI as a single person is in excess of $75,000, $112,500 for head of household or $150 joint, you're going to start losing the benefit. As your income exceeds that, you're going to be losing the benefit little by little, and it completely phases out for single people at $99,000 of, of adjusted gross income. For married filing joint filers, $198,000. So if you're above those thresholds, 
don't be looking in your bank account for the credits that are coming from the government because you're not going to receive those. They're going to look at 2018 or 2019 to calculate the AGI for the advance payment. And one interesting thing about this is this is an advance. This is a recovery rebate advance on a 2020 rebate that we're all going to uh, obtain when we file tax returns. The credit will be recalculated when we file in 20, our 2020 tax return, and it'll be based on the 2020 AGI. Now, one nice thing is that's unusual um, is if we have received, well, the nice thing is the later. If you've received less rebate than you should have gotten when 2020 is calculated, you will get the extra amount. But the nice thing is, is if you got too much, say your, your, your income uh, changed and that you, you received a couple hundred dollars more than you should have with the advance payment, you're not going to be required to pay that back. There's no adjustment for that. Now, those rules can change, but that's what's expressly in the act right now, that there will be no adjustment for that. And so that's a nice, uh, nice benefit. So people won't get caught with extra taxable income that they did not plan for or were not aware for, we're not aware of. Another great thing in the in the CARES Act, if you have need, is special uses, special rules for uses of retirement funds. If, as you know, if you're under 59 and a half and you make a distribution from your retirement plan or your IRA, there's a 10% penalty for that. If you make a, a, a distribution um, uh, through December the 31st of 2020 in response to coronavirus related matters, then that 10% penalty tax, that excise tax is not paid. Uh, distributions under this law, under the CARES Act, can exceed $100,000. Uh, they may not exceed $100,000 in the aggregate, and they and you can spread the income over a three-year period. So that's nice. Uh, it's still taxable. You're still going to pay tax on this money that you draw out of your retirement plans if you do. You're not going to pay the 10% penalty tax, but you will pay income tax. And so what they're allowing us to do is to spread that income over a three-year period beginning in 2020. So one-third of it would be taxable in 2020, one-third in 2021, one-third in 2022. And that income recognition can be avoided altogether if you repay the distribution to the retirement plan. So basically, um, a, 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 it could be like a, a loan from your retirement plan that that is basically you get a free do over. You get to send it all back within three years and, and pay no tax if um, if if that's your circumstance. But being able to, to make these distributions early without the penalty tax is a nice benefit in times of crisis. And so uh, appreciative of that. Uh, distributions are, are coronavirus related to an individual if any of these things apply. Um, you know, I'm, I've been, I'm diagnosed myself with COVID-19. I've got a spouse or dependent uh, who's diagnosed with COVID-19, or I, I have experienced adverse financial consequences as a result of being quarantined, furloughed, or laid off, having work, having to work reduced hours, whatever, regarding the COVID-19, then those are distributions that are coronavirus related. And here's an interesting thing. As a plan administrator, if you're an employer, and your employees are going to take distributions from their retirement plan that you are administrator of. You may rely on the certification of an employee that a condition was satisfied. You don't have to prove it as a plan administrator that that one of these things exists. If the employee certifies in writing that one of these things exists, you can take your employee certification and allow that to happen. Uh, so that removes that responsibility from the plan administrators to have to verify these things. Basically, if the employee says it's so, then it's so. And so be mindful there. Um, we have a lot of clients. I know uh, Velda Wood in her practice, we do in ours as well, who are required to make minimum distributions from their IRAs. They they are of age now where they are required to make those RMDs. Um, this CARES Act has waived the requirement for 2020. Yeah, so if you're in that situation and you're making you're you're taking distributions for RMDs right now, you'd rather not, but you're just having to because the, the law requires it, then you can skip that. Sorry about that. You can skip that for um, for 2020 and not worry about um, having to take that. So that's a nice a nice benefit. Also, uh, the CARES Act in regard to retirement plans, the limit on loans from retirement plans heretofore has been fifty thousand dollars. It increased that limit to a hundred thousand um, dollars, and the loan limit is increased for a hundred and eighty day period starting on the date of enactments. One hundred eighty day period. So. There's opportunity if you need resources from a retirement plan, there's opportunity for you to um, get that up to $100,000 rather than being limited to the 50. Charitable contributions, normally they're limited to 60% of your adjusted gross income. There's no limitation for 2020. 
So if your income is $100,000, you want to give away $100,000, then you can do that. Normally, you can only give up to 60% of your adjusted gross income. Another benefit is the, the qualified charitable contributions exceeds your taxpayer's AGI in 2020. So if it goes over, then you can carry those things forward. Another thing, too, is you know a lot of people aren't itemizing anymore because of the, the, the Jobs Act, the taxpayer cut and tax cut and jobs act of that Trump signed in one of his first years in office, you know, the sweeping tax changes from a year or two ago, um, increased the standard deduction significantly for taxpayers. And many people are not itemizing. So now we have this $300 above the line deduction. So if you don't itemize and you give to charity, you're gonna get a $300 above the line deduction, even if you don't itemize. So that's a, a nice thing too. And many of you might not know, but there's limitations on contributions that's, that corporations can make. And that's, it's been increased from 10% of their taxable income to 25%. Um, Section 127 won't apply to many people. I'll just touch on that briefly. That's the educational assistance programs that employers can do for their employees. The CARES Act allows you to pay principal and interest of the student loan if, if you wanted to do that. Uh, and if, of course, if that happens, the employee can't, um, can't deduct that interest on their tax return. All right, so business-related things, uh, subject to closure regarding COVID-19. We got a refundable payroll tax credit for 50% of wages paid to employers by employers to employees. Um, if operations were fully or partially suspended due to COVID-19, or if gross receipts declined by more than 50%, then you can receive a payroll tax credit up to 50 for 50% 50 of the wages you paid to your employees during that period of time. Now be mindful, if you are applying for a PPP loan, and then you are not eligible for this, for this credit. So if you're applying for PPP, this 50% credit of wages is not eligible for you. Many people don't realize that and are expecting to do both. That's not the case. If you've applied for a PPP loan, you're not getting the 50% credit for wages paid um, as a result. So be mindful there. There's another issue we'll talk about in just a second um, that impacts you as well if you've applied for a PPP loan. The credit against payroll taxes is specifically the employer share. Uh, the 6.2 percent of Social Security tax, and it's fully refundable. So if you if you're not getting enough of credit by the time you file your 941, you're gonna get a check. You'll get a refund. It's fully refundable, and so you will be paid back uh, in total by the at the latest worst case scenario when, when you file that 941. That one quarter away, three months is the most. It's 50 percent of qualified wages paid to an employee, and there's different rules for different sizes of employers. So be mindful there. If you're an employer with 100, with more than 100 full-time employees, qualified wages are those paid to employees who are, who are impacted due to COVID-19 circumstances. So I'm paying my, I'm open my employee's home because he's sick with COVID-19, I'm paying him. And I'm over 100 full-time employees, then I can, that's, a, that's an eligible qualified wage. The other wages that are not directly related to services, uh, due to COVID-19 circumstances are not qualified wages if you have more than 100 employees. If you have under 100, 100 or fewer full-time employees, then all employee wages qualify. So if you're under 100 all, and you're not applying for a PPP loan, all of your wages paid during this period are they qualify for this 50% credit. That's a nice benefit that um, we're looking at with clients whether or not the PPP loan is, is better than this. And in most cases it is, but there are, certain pockets where it's not, so be mindful there. The delay of payment of employer payroll taxes. We had a lot of talk about this until the bottom point became known. Um, you could actually, you, employers can, and self-employed taxpayers can defer or delay payment of the employer portion of the payroll taxes through the end of 2020. You can actually defer it 50% to 2021 paid in de on December 31st and 50% to 2022 paid on December 31st. It's a nice benefit to help with cash flow during this difficult time. It's not available to an employer, however, who had any debt, any indebtedness forgiven on a PPP loan. So if you applied for a PPP loan and you're pursuing forgiveness, which everybody is, if you applied, you are, um, you don't qualify for this as well. So be mindful there. The PPP loan application is taking you out of two of those um, nice credits that are in the law. So just be mindful there. Not what I would, what we're advising clients to be careful not to do, especially if they do their own payroll, is to apply for the PPP loan and then they start deferring their payroll taxes, thinking they're good, 
and then they'll get a ton of interest and penalties because they didn't pay them on time. So be mindful. There are things in the law that if you take advantage of one thing, you're not eligible for another. And so I'm trying to highlight those in this slide deck with, with some, some red highlights. Net operating losses, we'll skip through this, but if you do have net operating losses, uh, you can take it back now five years uh, from 2018. So you can go back a pretty good ways and offset taxable income. Um, net operating losses for years 2018, 19, and 20 can be carried back five years. So 2018 back to 2013, uh, that benefit was done away with with the Tax Cut and Jobs Act, Trump's first tax law. And so now we can do that. Be mindful that when you carry things back, things do change and it might not be dollar for dollar benefit, but that's if you do, if you are experiencing losses in 18, 19, 20, those things can be carried back five years um, to obtain some tax benefit there. It applies to C corporations and individuals, an opportunity to amend returns, take advantage of those carrybacks of losses when a, uh, you need to talk to your CPA um, about, if you do have net operating losses, you need to talk to them so you can analyze the benefit of that carryback. Most people will carry back, but be cautious, it doesn't always, uh, doesn't always um, benefit you. All right, so this is some other things that are that you might be, you might find useful, but I'm going to skip through some of these other uh, tax updates as, as they impact our small businesses. Uh, this modification of, of the limitation on business in, business interest could be very significant for some of our larger uh, corporate taxpayers. One thing here I wanted to mention the the the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act in its initial form was allowing qualified improvement property to qualify for the bonus depreciation, 100% bonus. It did, in, in the final rulings, it did it was not included. And so it was just a technical glitch that caused this problem. Well, it took a pandemic for us to get that fixed, but they did fix it. So the qualified improvement property that, um, it, it's basically interior improvements of a commercial property uh, is fully deductible, 100% bonus depreciation in year one. Uh, because it's been classified properly as a 15-year qualified improvement property subject to that bonus depreciation. There are some uh, tax-free disaster payments that you can provide to your employees. Be mindful of that. Now, the unemployment, we're going to be out of time in just a few minutes. Let me just scan through this very quickly. How does the CARES Act help the unemployed? Um, and this is more individual as opposed to uh, businesses, but be mindful uh, and we encourage our business owners not to advise or consult their uh, employees, but to encourage them to speak directly to the Alabama Department of Labor. The Act, the CARES Act, expands those who are eligible for benefits. It significantly increases the amount of benefits, and it facilitates administration of benefits. And this is an interesting thing. A state must reach an agreement. They must sign the agreement with the federal government in order for the CARES Act to become effective there. And as of Friday, and I, we searched yesterday and couldn't find that it had been done yet. As of Friday, the state of Alabama had not, did not have an agreement in place. And so the, the changes as a result of the CARES Act as of Friday were not applicable to Alabama citizens filing for unemployment. We fully expect this to happen um, in every state, that, that the agreement must be signed. They got to figure that out. So without CARES, just some unemployment basics, ignore CARES and the changes that that'll bring. It's administered by the states. It's funded by the federal and state government on the first 8,000 wages to all employees. Um, it applies to employees and not all types of workers, normally without cares. It applies to just regular employees uh, and they're entitled to benefits if they are unemployed or working reduced hours due to, whoops, due to no fault of their own. And that's important, due to no fault of their own. Uh, no benefits are given. This is unemployment. If an employee just quits without good cause connected with work and no benefits or benefits may be reduced if they're fired for misconduct. So these are unemployment basics before CARES. Um, and a, a potential person must be available for and seeking work. They must be able to work, not sick or injured, entitled to benefits. There's, they were not entitled to benefits for the first week. There was a waiting week. There is a waiting week in normal unemployment rules. That waiting week has now been waived under the CARES Act if our states have signed the agreement with the federal government. And currently the maximum benefit in Alabama is 275 before taxes. That's one of the lowest in the United States. Um, that's the current maximum benefit in Alabama before CARES. Um, and it normally takes two to three weeks to start receiving benefits after a claim is filed. So the CARES Act made some changes. So how are they, how are they, how are those changes impacting us? Be mindful of this. How are they calculated? How are benefits calculated in Alabama? It's a very complicated formula. Uh, your weekly benefit rate, a WBR, will be 126 of your average quarterly earnings in your two highest paid quarters in the base period. The base period is a is 
four of the most recent five full quarters that you worked previous to applying for unemployment. So it's a nightmare calculation. Uh, it's very, very difficult to try to determine what that might be on your own. Seek the Department of Labor's help there. And employee gets benefits for 26 weeks under normal unemployment. So, and they're chargeable to the employer. So if your employees go and apply for unemployment, uh, your rate's gonna go up. And uh, if under COVID-19, if your employer, if the employer will file partial claims on behalf of the employees in response to COVID-19, uh, the expectation is that they would not be charged to the employer. And we kind of expect that um, the charges will not be applied to the employer um, regardless, but we'll see how the Alabama Department of Labor responds to that. So how does the CARES Act impact unemployment benefits? It applies, it applies to individuals out of work as a, as a direct result of COVID-19, and this is new, covered self-employed self people and independent contractors are eligible under CARES. Whenever the state signs the agreement with the federal government, they will be eligible to apply for unemployment benefits. It includes churches and uh, church employees, heretofore not eligible, now they are. It applies to nonprofit and governmental employees. It includes gig, gig economy workers. My, my best example of a gig economy worker is if you've ever um, taken an Uber from the airport, that Uber driver, that's a gig economy worker. Uh, it's different than normal employment situations, a, a gig economy worker, but they're now eligible for unemployment under the CARES Act. And it also covers those who've exhausted state and federal unemployment benefits. You know, you can exhaust those numbers 26 weeks um, and, and don't qualify for any more, but the CARES Act has, gone, has expanded that. And they've eliminated the waiting week for employees who go to the Department of Labor. Workers who have exhausted the state benefits are entitled to an additional 13 weeks. So instead of 26, it's 39 weeks total now. And the CARES Act, this is the nugget, this is the, the, the golden nugget in the CARES Act for the unemployed, is it adds $600 per week on, on top of whatever the state law entitlement is. So after they go through that, that horrific calculation to determine what the state amount is, the CARES Act says we're gonna add $600 to whatever that is. So if it's $100 a week, calculated on the state formula, then it would be plus 600, so that'd be $700 um, under current rules. And of course, each state's having to work it out, but that would be that would increase whatever the calculation is by $600. And if you're eligible for benefits under state law, you are eligible, automatically entitled to the extra $600. So workers obtain benefits by going directly to the Alabama Department of Labor. Again, be cautious how you advise. If you're an employer talking to employees, direct them to the Alabama Department of Labor because there are a number of things that employers just should not be answering for their employee, employees. Employers should not be answering for their employees. Um, but the worker must, decide, must certify that he or she meets one of the required conditions. This is all those conditions. I'm not gonna go through these in detail with you, but these are all here for you to be, to, so your employees can have these are the conditions uh, that the employee, when they go to the Department of Labor, will be certifying that they meet one of these. It's it's important that they, you know, that they just have to meet one of the required conditions, not multiple ones. So any one of these, certainly if they diagnose themselves with COVID-19, they're in. And there's a lot of other things here to be mindful of. Um, and so a question that came up in Congress when they were debating this, would some workers be better off on unemployment? And the, and the answer to that question is, is yes. There will be some workers in certain industries that will be better off on unemployment. And so employers will, might be struggling to find employees who are in their 26 or 39 week period on unemployment. So be mindful there. If you're an employer um, who employs some low wage employees, there's, there's potential that, that you know, they're not coming back until they, until they roll off the unemployment. So be mindful there. Um, will COVID-19, Unemployment benefits be chargeable to the employer. Right now, we just do not know. We expect that many states are gonna be adopting procedures and regulations so that employers are not charged for that. It's in the spirit of the law itself. But right now, we just do not, we just do not know. So according to the Alabama Department of Labor, uh, they have not yet received technical guidance or a start date regarding the CARES Act programs. Um, and, but don't, but your employees, or if you're an individual, not to worry, um, it, it, they clearly state that they're gonna pay the benefits retroactively to the time the employee separated from his or her job or otherwise became eligible under the Federal CARES Act. So 
Um, if, if, it's, if there's a delay in Alabama getting things done because of technical guidance or whatever, uh, they're stating they're going to pay retroactively for employees who, who need to file for that unemployment. How do they file? They need to go online to www.labor.alabama.gov or calling this number 1-866-234-5382. The Alabama Department of Labor is already putting out notices to please be patient with them. Um, they are overwhelmed with, with applications for unemployment. It, overwhelmed is not the right word. They are not prepared for the number of unemployment claims that they are trying to process. And further details, they keep reminding all of us that further details regarding the CARES Act programs will be forthcoming. So there's a lot of answers to questions that are, there's a lot of questions to which there are no answers. The answers are simply, we just don't know yet. Two weeks ago, 80,964 unemployment claims were filed in Alabama. And last week alone, through Wednesday, 66,000 claims were filed in the first three days, on pace to top 90,000 claims for the week. So it's a horrific number for unemployment. You've heard some estimates in the, um, in the, um, in the marketplace and the news media that you know, literally one third of the country could end up being unemployed as a result of this pandemic. And is that realistic? And the answer to that question is we just don't know at this point. And I'm praying that that would not be the case. But uh, in Alabama, we're seeing significant numbers of unemployment claims being filed. Um, and, and so our, your employees that are filing those are, are in line and having to wait while the Alabama Department of Labor is figuring out how to process all those claims. And I would say they're doing a, a great job for, for what they are set up to do. Uh, they're not set up to respond to this number of this this number of claims. So really, that's the end of the presentation. I'll, I'll mute myself now. I didn't know. I couldn't tell if there were any questions in the chat, but I'll turn this back over to Will. Certainly call our office if you need help. Call the chamber. Uh, we appreciate uh, the time to share with you guys and wish you all the best. All right. Well, Todd, thanks so much for uh, taking your time to present today. We really appreciate it. Um, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat right now. Uh, I do want to mention before we are before we wrap up with some questions potentially. Um, I made a mistake at the beginning and thought I started recording, so I started recording a little before halfway through the presentation. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll post that recording to the site like I would anyway. But I will actually I'll save this PowerPoint as a PDF if that's fine with Todd, and uh, include a link to that as well. You guys to be able to access that uh, that may not have had time to look over the first portion of it that may have been missed in the recording. Um, also, the uh, we, have, we do have two more uh, finance administration chamber councils for the rest of the year. One's in August, one's in December. The one in August is planned to be uh, surrounding cybersecurity, and the one in uh, December is supposed to be revolving around retirement plan comparisons for small businesses. So make sure you mark those for your calendar. We'll be definitely send us invitations for those. Uh, but with that being said, if there are any questions, please submit them at this time in the chat box. Emily Mills. Todd, you still on the call? <clears throat> I am. Okay. Uh, Emily Mills, can you review the state calculation for um, Paycheck Protection Program again? It is my understanding of what you said that the way Alabama calculates the state taxes, this does not qualify for addition into our PPP calculation. All right. So the state taxes that are included in your in your payroll cost, the only tax to include here in the state of Alabama is the state unemployment. Um, there was some com confusion from a lot of taxpayers, a lot of businesses that you would add in your state and local withholding taxes. That's not true. It, the only tax, the state and local tax assessed on the compensation that the employer pays is the state unemployment. And so you would have four quarterly forms, the UCCR4, uh, that if you use a payroll service, they'll be able to provide that for you. If a CPA firm is providing payroll for you, they'll be able to provide that for you. And it's not a lot of money. State unemployment doesn't cost an employer significant sums of money, but it does add into your total payroll cost calculation that you would then divide by 12 and multiply by two and a half. <clears throat> Emily says thanks. <laughs> uh, Nanda, let's see. Uh, Nanda is asking if the employee leaves and gets paid the 36 week uh, $600, do I get forgiven for that? All right, if the employee leaves and gets paid the 36 week $600, do I get forgiven for that? Um, no, that that's unemployment compensation that is received directly from the state Department of Labor. 
Um, your expenses that would qualify for forgiveness would be payroll, um, the payroll cost calculation that we went over, also mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. That's the only money that you would spend that would be entered into the calculation that would qualify for forgiveness. The extra $600 that employees might receive through the CARES Act is the unemployment they would receive from the state of Alabama, not from their employers. So be mindful there. Uh, I wanted to mention also, if it, uh, I had a, a question that came through in private, just want to make sure I was clear on that. The IRA contribution requirement normally due by April, uh, it has also been extended until July 15th with the due date of the tax return. So if you would normally make an IRA contribution for yourself, you have until July the 15th to make that. So be mindful there. Okay, Todd, do you see the chat function clip after the question? It's a quite extensive one, so you might want to read that for yourself. Uh, do you see that in the chat, Todd? I do, I do, and, and uh, I don't know if everybody else can, so I'll repeat that question. Cliff's question is, on the on the FFCRA, uh, there are exemptions for employers with under 50 employees in some healthcare companies. That's, that's absolutely true. Do you recommend participation in this program? I am in healthcare and have a few employees that could benefit due to having kids at home out of school, but if everyone decides to take leave, it would prevent me from adequately staffing by company to provide essential services. Can you elect to participate on a week by week basis depending on circumstances? Our understanding of that cliff is that um, in, an exemption from that act is something that would have to be applied for. The procedures for that are not clear, but it would not be, um, it would not be a week by week determination, it would be I'm in or I'm out. And I'm gonna claim exemption because I'm under 50 or I'm either a healthcare company or it would be a hardship for my, for my company to do it. Those are reasons when you're under 50 to make that claim for exemption. And, uh, and we, we don't know, I haven't, we haven't had any experience with that yet on, on that exemption process, but um, um, it will not be a week by week determination. It's an in or out, either I'm exempt or I'm not. So be mindful there. Great, thanks Todd, thanks for the answer. Um, it's 11 o'clock, do we have any more questions that uh, anyone would like to ask? Velda says, awesome job, Todd. Thank you, Velda, I'm sure. And then Cliff has another question. All right, Cliff's asking, how do you recommend we, re we reply to the employee rights poster? Uh, Cliff, it might be better if we, you and I speak offline about that, but I, I want to see the poster that you're referring to. We have one hanging in our office. I want to make sure it's the same. Um, I'm assuming you want to reply to your employees if they have a question about some of those things that are being notified of, to them there. So maybe we can circle back. Will, if you can connect to us, that would be great. Yeah, what I'll do, uh, if you don't mind, Todd, I'll just copy and paste your email address into the chat. That's fine. Be a perfect way to do it. For anyone to take, take that down to me. Grab it quick, one second. I can type it in, I think, pretty quickly. Yeah, because it's, I'm operating off two monitors, so it's a lot easier to just type it in. <laughs> I think I sent that to just one person. Let me send it to everyone. All right, so that's my email address. If anybody needs to reach out with a specific question, I'll be glad to try to help you. Okay, well, I just wanna... go ahead, Velda. Okay. I'm sorry, it's Velda. I just want to say thank you, Todd, for agreeing to speak to us, and you can, you all can see why um, I recommended Todd. So, great job. Thank you, Velda. <clears throat> well, um, so I guess wrapping up, uh, Velda, thank you and the Eugenius Advisory Group for sponsoring this year's set of Finance Administration Councils. I hope you guys enjoyed the first one of this year. Uh, thank you, Tom, for making time out of your, I know your busy, busy day to join us today and speak to some folks. Um, again, I'll have the recording posted on our website, and I'll also have a PDF version of the PowerPoint since the recording wasn't turned on early enough. But with that being said, I'm going to end the meeting. Um, you guys have a fantastic week, and make sure you stay safe and healthy. Take care, everyone. <laughs>